Good evening. Health authorities have... These vehicles may or may not have mechanical... It will be a trial within a trial. It will be at the Ontario... The city health. does have a bylaw that requires... December 20th, 1984. This is Toronto. Morgan Taller charge. South African boycott. And a party for Lindsay. City Pulse with Gord Martineau, Deanie Petty, Debbie Van Kekabelt. And the City Pulse news team bring you Toronto's News. Good evening. A demonstration underway right now outside Queen's Park by angry pro-abortion supporters. This after new charges were laid against Dr. Henry Morgenthaler and one of his colleagues. Lauren Honickman is there right now at the City Pulse live by Lauren. Gore, these pro-choice supporters are listening to various speeches right now. They'll be here now. They'll be later on. They'll be at 52 Division when Dr. Morgenthaler comes in. The charge is the same one that doctors were acquitted on back on November 8th. Conspiracy to procure a miscarriage. Dr. Robert Scott was arrested outside the clinic last night. Morgenthaler was in Montreal today. I spoke to him over the phone. Although he was somewhat bitter, he was surprisingly relaxed. No, I'm not upset. Why should I be upset? I was just acquitted by a jury. I think it's a sign of contempt for the jury system. It's completely uh, unjustified. It shows, a, <laughs> if I would say with a chuckle, a lack of imagination. Today, anti-abortionists continue their protest outside the clinic, although all abortions here have been canceled till January the 4th. 20 women were scheduled to have abortions today and tomorrow. The clinic is open for referral and counseling now, and arrangements are being made to get all the women to Montreal. The Montreal Clinic is opening on Saturday and into next week to ensure that all the women that have been uh, booked here over the next three days, that was the plan for the clinic, will be able to get an abortion in Montreal. Rebic says she's outraged by the latest charges, and so is Morgenthaler's lawyer, Morris Manning. Here We've got four juries that have said we will not enforce this law. Why do we need a fifth? and a sixth and a seventh. It's a policy statement by the Ontario Conservative government as to what they think about women, and they don't care. As a police officer, I'm sworn to uh, uphold the law and to enforce the law, and I've done that. You feel that's the best in the public interest? I think in the public interest that uh, that certainly is the action that should be taken. No person should be seen, in my opinion, to be above the law. Uh, Chief Marks is then the one that determines what's in the public interest. It is not in the public interest to deny women safe therapeutic abortions. If he's going to arrest the doctors who perform the abortions in the clinics, then he's got to, at the very same time, to protect the, quote, public interest, provide access to safe therapeutic abortions in the hospital. Well, Gord, we don't know if uh, Chief Marks will do that, but as I say, Morgenthaler will be flying in tonight. He's going to give himself up to police. I'll be out at the airport, and I'll have all the details for you on City Pulse tonight at 10. Gord? Lauren, there's an element of surprise here. I think the media and the public were both expecting a raid on the clinic prior to any new charges being laid, but this time all they did was issue the warrants. Exactly. That was one of two surprises. Uh, the last time they did the raid, they said they had to do it to gather the physical evidence. They still might raid the clinic. We don't know. The other surprise is the charge, conspiracy. That's a very difficult charge to prove. Maybe not on Morgenthaler's part, because he talked about it all the time, but Dr. Scott, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Thank you, Lauren. We'll talk to you later okay, on. Okay, Gordon. On the crime beat tonight, Mark Daly updates two homicide cases and has details on a robbery suspect picked up thanks to the media. 21-year-old Daniel Clatney of Brampton has been charged with two West End bank robberies in the past month after we ran this photo taken by a bank surveillance camera the other night. Somebody spotted that picture all right and recognized the man. Some information went to the holdup squad, and last evening they yanked a suspect off a gray coach bus bound for Belleville. The man was charged later. It was a year ago tonight that Erin Gilmore was found bound and stabbed in her Hazelton Avenue apartment. She was found dead just a half hour after leaving work at a boutique in the same building. Investigators have not been able to fill in that half hour and get their man. There's been a lot of people interviewed, uh, well over 700 interviews conducted to date. Um, we've used a computer uh, to assist us in our investigation. Uh, we're still, at this time, no closer to, uh, to solving the murder than we were a year ago. Cleveland says he hopes this case doesn't end up like other notable slayings of women in past years. He's not giving up. Not too many days go by that you don't think about it. Uh, uh, 
continuously, actually, wondering what haven't I done, uh, what can I do to, uh, to get a little closer. Other homicide teams are making some progress and receiving a lot of help on the Susan Siegel slaying. The downtown prostitute was found dead earlier this week, strangled near the Ontario stockyards. On the crime beat, Mark Daly, City Pulse. A 17-year-old teen who stole a car to sleep in will not go to jail for Christmas. Ian Urquhart admitted in court he stole a 1982 Oldsmobile because his parents had disowned him and he had no place to live. In court today, Judge Hugh O'Connell reserved decision on the case until tomorrow. He did say, however, that the youth will not be jailed and he ordered Urquhart's lawyers to find him a place to stay. You will recall last night we told you Metro Chairman Dennis Flynn will investigate an ad run in a Hong Kong newspaper by a commissioner of the Toronto Transit Commission, Gordon Chong. The ad offers to assist real estate people who want to locate here. Tonight, Colin Vaughn tells us Chong was recently appointed to another important and sensitive post in Metro. The come-by-chance story we received from Hong Kong's English-language daily newspaper tells about an advertisement run in a convention brochure in that city. An ad placed by a Toronto dentist and one-time politician now sitting on, and I quote, the Public Transport Management Committee of Greater Toronto, and according to the ad, able to steer investors to development opportunities in Metro. The dentist, former City of Toronto Ward 6 Alderman Gordon Chong, who now sits on the Toronto Transit Commission, and who will be asked by Metro Chairman Dennis Flynn to explain the meaning of the advertisement, linking Chong's public responsibilities at the TTC with real estate deals. Today I again asked Chong for an interview. He promised to call back, but there's been no call yet. But another call yeah, did like come in from a concerned back, watchdog yeah. citizens group in North York. Really like they pointed out that Chong had recently been appointed to the Planning Advisory Committee of North York Council, making him privy to further inside information on planning issues in Metro. North York Mayor Mel Lastman is away, but Acting Mayor Esther Shiner intends to look into the matter. The only proper thing for me to do is call Dr. Chong and sit down and speak to him about this. Would it worry you if that's, uh, those are the words he's used? Um, I'd have to find out why he, why he said that, really, and then I'll know whether to worry or not. I'm, why I, do you think he said it from that? I have no idea. As far as I'm concerned, he's a dentist, and he's practicing dentistry. And, and Esther means business. When I talked to Gordon Chong this afternoon, he said that he'd already been contacted by Controller Shiner asking him for a copy of the ad. Collarbone City Hall, City Pulse. Just, you know, Canada's largest menorah was lit at Old City Hall today to commemorate the holiday of Hanukkah. MPP David Rotenberg was lifted in a cherry picker to the top of the 22-foot structure to perform the ceremony. An additional light will appear each day to mark the eight-day celebration. Quite a workout today for the Civil Services Choir. Today, NDP leader Bob Ray was among the guests to hear the carolers at the McDonald Block at Queen's Park. An extra special Christmas party today for little Lindsay Aberhard. Look for an update on Lindsay's condition with Deanie Petty and the story of the party and Anne Roskowski a little later on City Pulse Close Up. An early look at what's happening in the streets of Toronto now as we go live to our chief assignment editor, Glenn Cole. Thank you very much, Gordon. The day started badly this morning because of a fire fatality in a senior citizen's home at 4205 Lawrence Avenue East in Scarborough. The fire broke out in an apartment shortly after 6 o'clock, and when Scarborough firefighters arrived, they found an elderly female unconscious in the apartment, but efforts to bring her around were futile. She was transported to hospital by Metro Ambulance, and pronounced dead on arrival. Her name has not been released pending notification of next of kin. Damage amounted to $12,000 and there were no other injuries. A serious accident on the southbound Don Valley near Don Mills gummed up traffic for over two hours this afternoon, but that now has finally been cleared up. So the only other thing to be concerned about is the driving weather. So let's get the latest on that by going live down to Queen Street and weather specialist David Onley. Thank you, Glenn. David will join us a little later in the program. And coming up next on City Pulse at 6, the issue of Canadian trade with South Africa. <laughs> well, should Canada boycott South Africa? I don't think it would hurt to try it. No, I uh, don't believe that they should. 
I don't approve of what they're doing in South Africa, but uh, I don't believe that we should get involved in the internal affairs of another country. Yes, I think they should. I don't believe in apartheid, and I don't think we should support them. No more Canadian money spent in South Africa. That's what Nobel Peace Prize winner Bishop Desmond Tutu is asking of Canada. Before heading for Toronto tonight, the South African bishop met with Prime Minister Brian Mulroney in Ottawa. Brian Isui was there. Bishop Tutu and Mulroney exchanged greetings. Men met behind closed doors for about a half hour. Tutu won the Nobel Peace Prize this year for speaking out against racial discrimination in his homeland. Tutu wants Canada to reduce its trade with South Africa because of its system of racial segregation known as apartheid. It's government policy there to reserve the best houses, schools and jobs for the 5 million whites while denying a voice in government for the 22 million blacks. At a news conference later, Tutu spoke briefly of his meeting with the Prime Minister. The point that I seek to make is that investment or um, economic involvement in South Africa is as much a moral issue as it is an economic issue and that you cannot have it um, otherwise. You cannot have a neutrality. You've got to decide whether you're going to be on the side of the oppressed or on the side of the oppressor, on the side of evil or on the side of uh, freedom. Tutu said he wouldn't publicly suggest that Canadian trade or investment be stopped he says it's up to Canada to make its own judgment. Tutu returns to Johannesburg in the next couple of weeks because his travel papers expire. He says he could be jailed for protesting so strongly against government policy. Brian Yasui in Ottawa, City Pulse tonight. Because Canadian trade with South Africa amounts to several hundred million dollars a year, many people believe we should cut that trade to show how we feel about South African policies. Tonight, Jeff Ansel looks at the pros and cons of trading with South Africa. Riots in South Africa, the result of apartheid, the separation of the races as a national policy. It is this bloodshed and violence Bishop Tutu, an outspoken critic of South Africa's white minority government, hopes to win. Upwards of 30,000 South Africans, blacks and whites, now live in Metro. Most left their homeland to protest that country's apartheid policies. And many will be here at the Metropolitan United Church tomorrow night at 7.30 to hear Bishop Tutu speak. 43-year-old Joe Mangati will be there. Apartheid is the most important policy that, uh, that this world has ever seen. Joe Mangati left South Africa two years because ago, just as police were poised to arrest him for the crime of helping others leave. I feel that Canada shouldn't trade with South Africa because it gives credence to this most uh, hateful system that goes on. It makes them appear respectable. Toronto Sun columnist and former City TV host Morton Shulman, who recently returned from a two-week visit to South Africa, calls apartheid despicable, but believes the answer is to pour more money into that nation. Uh, ten years ago, when there was very little trade, there was a small pie. All skilled jobs were held by whites. With the increase of investment in South Africa, more and more skilled jobs are going to blacks because the pie is getting bigger. There's more for everybody. Uh, restaurants are now mixed. Uh, the beaches are mixed. Sports are totally unsegregated so that there's great progress being made. That is all cosmetic. It's nothing, there's no, there, there's no gains made whatsoever. There may be some gains, but uh, so far they have not been things that uh, the victims of apartheid would be able to say that they have perceived. Despite the fact blacks can now eat in some white Johannesburg restaurants, blacks and whites cannot go to a bar together for a drink, can't ride the same buses, can't use the same toilets. What I see happening in South Africa in the future is total war. That's the only answer. Bishop Tutu will no doubt tell his church audience that changes can be made peacefully in South Africa and that the guerrilla warfare we saw in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, can be avoided in his country. In the words of one great philosopher, those who don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. <laughs> Jeff Ansel, City Pulse. A big drop in the bank rate today. It fell more than a quarter of a point at 10.16 percent. In anticipation of the drop, Canada's major chartered banks lowered their prime rates earlier in the day by half a point to 11 and a quarter percent. The Toronto Stock Exchange ended the day on a low note, closing down 4.92 to 2,386.21. One of the Bay Street's major brokerage firms showed its festive spirit today by activating a unique charity raising method. 
But Peter Silverman says this could be the start of a whole way of raising money for worthy causes. Who says those big stock brokerage firms on Bay Street don't have heart, that they don't have a little bit of the Christmas spirit? Well, I'll prove it to you that they have. Gentlemen, fellow Santas, today we're working not for ourselves, but for four extremely deserving children's charities. Let's go and canvas our clients and generate some commissions for a really worthy cause. Ho, 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 ho. These Santas aren't Santas at all. They're Wood Gundy retail stock traders, but they're trading with a difference. Season's greetings, Wood Gundy, 42nd Street. How is it different? It's a unique fundraising drive for Toronto charities. Wood Gundy is donating all the commission it makes and all the transactions going through its 42nd Street office to charity. How long have you been doing this? Peter, this is the second anniversary of Wood Gundy, 42nd Street, and it's the first year that we've done this. How much money are you think you're going to raise? Well, as of 2 o'clock, we were just through $75,000 in gross commissions. And that goes to it, four charities, it, I believe? It goes to four charities. The clients can choose between the CKFM Fund in support of the Hospital for Sick Children, the Toronto Star Santa Claus Fund, the Jewish Family and Child Services, and Ronald McDonald House Toronto. So far, it looks as if the Santas will be able to donate $100,000 to the four charities. One good reason, the orders placed through the office by the big financial institutions on Bay Street. As for the Santas, well, it's one way of saying Merry Christmas from Bay Street. It could also be the start of a new way to raise funds for needy causes. I'm Peter Silverman for City Pulse. Retailers hoping for good Christmas sales like last year may end up disappointed. Pre-Christmas price markdowns in eastern Canada began early. That's usually a sign of trouble. But department store heads deny they have an oversupply, at least a huge one, of seasonal goods. But they do admit the warm weather is hurting sales of outerwear. The Mulroney government wants more Japanese investment in Canada. In Tokyo today, External Affairs Minister Joe Clark told businessmen, Japanese investment is not only welcome, it's encouraged. He also promised more visits to Japan by members of the Mulroney government. And while Clark continues his tour of Japan, British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher is into the second day of a visit to Hong Kong. Brian Hanrahan tells us security was very tight today. Mrs. Thatcher arrived amid the security that must accompany the Prime Minister these days, especially in Hong Kong, where five and a half million people live crowded closely together. But after a swift and well-guarded exit from the airport, she embarked on a program that threw her right into the middle of the people. Mrs. Thatcher's first call was at a housing estate overlooking Aberdeen Harbour, a chance to see something of the lifestyle of modern-day Hong Kong and to meet some of its people. For the local children, it was a chance to show off their English. For Mrs. Thatcher, faced with an anxious community needing reassurance, it was practical politics, something Hong Kong has never had, but will have to learn if it's to develop its own democratic system in the run-up to 1997. 500 people got a chance to talk to her at a reception, and then in a televised address, she pledged Britain to do its utmost to make the agreement work. And I bring from my talks in Peking, with the most senior Chinese leaders, a similar commitment. They assured me that for their part, that the agreement would be faithfully implemented. Before finishing, Mrs. Thatcher said the concerns of the people were understandable. But she said Hong Kong was a growing concern with a future stretching into the next century and beyond. The killer gas tank in Bhopal, India is empty tonight. Scientists have successfully emptied the underground tank to try and find out what caused the leak that killed more than 2,000 people. Officials believe the leak occurred after pressure built up and a valve burst, bypassing a neutralizer that was supposed to render the gas harmless. A spectacular explosion and fire today in northern England. Richard Wells tells us a freight train loaded with fuel blew up in a two-mile tunnel. 200 feet below the Pennines lies the stricken freight train. Its cargo of 600 tons of petrol fuels the fire, which then erupts to the surface through ventilation shafts, shooting flames 200 feet into the sky. There are 10 derailed petrol tankers wedged in the center of the tunnel, and it's impossible to tell how many have exploded. 
More than 200 firemen are working to try to bring the blaze under control, but to get inside the tunnel is impossible. Earlier, some firemen had a lucky escape when the train first exploded. Immediately afterwards, people living in cottages straddling the tunnel began to be evacuated. Firemen say it's impossible to get the fire under control. The best they can do is keep the petrol fumes and the fire within the tunnel. And that is bringing further problems. The possibility of the entire tunnel, 2,800 yards long, collapsing. In Rochdale, eight miles away, there are reports that rivers are becoming polluted with petrol from the derailed train. Emergency services have been facing an uphill task since before dawn. Their one bit of luck, a ventilation shaft free from smoke and flames, in which they pumped thousands of gallons of foam down into the tunnel. But it had little effect. No one has been injured, but the emergency high in the Pennines between Leeds and Manchester is far from over. People evacuated from their homes aren't expected to be allowed back tonight, and the fire continues to rage. In the United States, the Federal Energy Department has made 47 states very happy and three very angry. The department has concluded that Texas, Nevada, and Washington State appear to be the safest places to dump highly radioactive waste. Jeff Smith County is considered prime farm and cattle land. It's also a good bet to become this country's first high-level nuclear waste dump. The underground storage center would eventually house 70,000 metric tons of radioactive material. State officials say an accident could rupture the facility, leak nuclear waste into the aquifer, and contaminate the water supply. Tragedies can happen, and we do not want a tragedy to take place that would contaminate the entire water supply for our West Texas agricultural activities. While the state's against the project, the people of Deaf Smith are split 50-50. Businessman John Smith approves, says it'll mean 1,500 jobs. We need the business. That's basically what it boils down to as far as I'm concerned, the way I look at it. But farmers and ranchers are outraged. Walter Vogler says a nuclear dump could force him out of business. Which package of beef would you buy first? The one in, from the nuclear dump site or one that wasn't anywhere around it? The site for the nuclear dump won't actually be selected until 1990. But Texas Governor Mark White is already preparing for bureaucratic war. What a cruel hoax. He says a lot of sparks will fly in Washington before he lets Texas glow in the dark with radiation. Robert Elliott, NBC News, Houston. U.S. Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger is seeing red over leaked reports that next month's shuttle Discovery will carry a new spy satellite. Weinberger says stronger laws must be needed to protect sensitive information. And he criticized the Washington Post for what he said was journalistic irresponsibility. The Post first reported details of the satellite, which will apparently intercept radio, telephone, and satellite transmissions, and fly in a stationary orbit over the Soviet Union. Close up is next on City Pulse at 6, a Christmas wish for little Lindsay Aberhart. Yes, I have signed my August birthday card. Uh, I figure there's someone in the hospital who will need it more than I would. I signed it because I feel that if I'm dead, you know, at least some part of me can go on living and help some other person. No, I haven't signed my organ donor card because I believe in the sanctity of the body. A close up tonight, a Christmas party for a special guest and her family. Lieutenant Governor John Black Aird hosted the get together for two year old Lindsay Aberhart, her parents, brother, and sister, and of course, Ann Muskowski was there. Hello. Hello. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is, a, I think, a day of honor for uh, Christine and uh, and Jim because they're absolute uh, hero. She's a hero and he's a hero. So that's the reason for this today. And when I first uh, yeah. made the appeal last February, I must say I didn't think that we would have this Christmas. So uh, this is a rather special day for, for me. I, I forgot to say the magic word. You know the magic word? Focus, focus. For a few precious moments today, Lindsay's urgent need for a liver transplant was momentarily forgotten. With her sister Jacqueline and brother Stephen, the magic of Christmas shone through Lindsay's eyes. How about a, how about a bumblebee? A bumblebee? Oh, wow. <laughs> 
The Lieutenant Governor's deep admiration for the Eberhards underscores his devotion to a cause that began with the frantic search for a donor liver for Lindsay. I think that possibly this kind of event may give some impetus to, to organ donations, which uh, after all are the, are the gift of life. And uh, you see here a living example of, uh, of what courage can do. I've got something else from Santa Claus. For Christine and Jim, though, there is a new worry this Christmas season. They recently learned Lindsay's tiny body is failing to metabolize vitamin E, a disturbing complication apparently unrelated to her fatal liver disease. And they usually don't find it in children with biliary atresia, but they more often find it in children with liver disease that progresses for like 10 years into teenhood. And they said that that worries them, and they have to find out why. It's, it's being this way. And I said that it's probably the most reason why she's not walking or crawling as much as she should be. With Christmas so near, there is only one wish in the Eberhard household, the gift only another child can give. I'd like to see the new year start off with a new life for Lindsay as well. That would mean the most. That's my wish too. Mm. How many livers have been available, say through the last six months of the Moore program, do you know? Yeah, I was speaking today to Robert Smith of the Moore por program, and he said that there were four or five livers that became available, but t to, match, to match them up, there have, it has to be the same blood type and the same right. size, and, and none of them have been compatible for Lindsay. With this new vitamin E problem, does that move Lindsay up on the priority list at all? I would imagine so, but there will have to be more tests to discover exactly why she is failing to metabolize the vitamin E. It seems to be a problem that is affecting her development, I mean, they're saying that she is not crawling or walking like a child should at her age. And they couldn't identify earlier why that was, but now it seems to be this is the problem. It looks to me, in that, that her, her reactions, her emotional response seems to be a lot less. Have you, I mean, you're very close with this child. Is that correct? Yes, it's true. Lindsay is a very reactive child. She's a very yeah. sunny child. But today, especially, you often, you sometimes see her reacting very well to situations, but Today, where you saw a clown and magic and she was getting gifts, she was just, she was not reacting. She was very placid. And this is a symptom of her disease. She's getting sicker. It's a very kind and generous thing that the lieutenant governor has done. And, and I, I guess, like everybody, our, our wish for Lindsay is that, that soon, this Christmas, it will bring her her, her much-needed present. Absolutely. Okay. We'll be back in just a moment with the latest word on weather and entertainment. Everybody a monster. Jeannie Becker, coming up, entertainment Bob Schneider style in Every Kid's a Star. Now our City Pulse News Ted. What is the new Bank of Canada rate? If you know the answer, call us at 870-7770. The seventh correct caller wins six suntan sessions at Sunbank Island Tanning. Four evenings from now, it will be Christmas Eve. The question, David, is will there be snow Christmas Day? I'll make you hang on and wait for the answer for that one. Well, first of all, we'll take a look at this low pressure zone moving across the Midwest United States and into Toronto very quickly overnight, bringing us showers by lunch. We thought there'd be freezing rain, but there isn't. It'll be just rain, showers by lunch. By Saturday, it'll be cloudy and flurries. We're getting some good indicators that maybe something nice might happen on Christmas Day beyond the presents and the festivities. Let's take a look at how things were earlier today. We can take a look at some footage taken by uh, Pedro Zucat, one of our cameramen at City TV, and uh, this is his dad. And it was his birthday, and I can't think of a much better present than a son taking a picture of his dad and uh, putting it on TV. Happy birthday, Mr. Zucat. The record high for this day in 1957, 13 degrees Celsius, and the record low, minus 27 degrees Celsius. That is cold. Let's go down to Queen Street right now and take a live eye look at the parking lot across the street from City. Present temperature minus 2 degrees Celsius or 29 Fahrenheit. Winds are from the west northwest at 19 kilometers per hour. And the barometric pressure is 102.0 and rising. Relative humidity 80%. Now to our Teledon graphic system, the computer system. You can see that tomorrow morning the showers down by Windsor will be approaching us so that by midday, 
that's going to be basically all around. We'll be right in the middle of it. As far as Saturday is concerned, some flurries and a high of zero. That's a very good sign if you're looking towards Christmas Day. Sunday, a high of minus two and cloudy. For Christmas Eve, Christmas Day and Christmas Eve, that looks like rain. It is rain. A high of four, which doesn't sound too seasonable, but for Christmas Day, we're calling for a dusting of snow and a high of minus three. And now, we check uh, the uh, system for in the Georgian Bay area for the ski maps, and we can see that there will be localized squalls on Saturday um, and overcast and cloudy for Sunday afternoon. And as far as this evening is concerned, we can take a look at our system here and see that tonight it will be cloudy, and we'll be going down to a minus one, uh, excuse me, minus three for later this evening. And tomorrow morning, it's going to get uh, cold. It'll be cold up to minus one. There will be some showers, and then by midday, it will be up to four degrees. So we start the last countdown procedure, shall we say, for the Christmas season by getting a little bit unseasonable and then just keep the fingers crossed, dusting of snow on Christmas morning. Deanie, back to you. Our Christmas present to you is we hope you get your voice back, David. <laughs> Around town today, buy a brick and help the St. Michael's Hospital Building Fund. So far, the hospital has raised over seven million. The target is $25 million. Now, the booth is open for one more day, and they're in the Eaton Center, just in front of Collegiate Sports. For income tax purposes, you'll get a receipt in return for buying a brick for $10, so do your good deed and help them out. We have a surprise visitor today, Yogi Bear, came down to make a donation, and a very generous one, to the Chum City Christmas Wish. In the little basket, two stuffed toys and ten season passes to Wonderland. And then Yogi got extremely generous and donated an image of himself, a large stuffed Yogi Bear. Some lucky kid is going to get that on Christmas Day. Can you see the child's eyes when he gets or she gets that for Christmas? Thank you, Yogi. Thank you, Wonderland. That was very kind. You can still donate to the Chum City Christmas Wish and help give a kid a Christmas. Go to any branch of the Royal Bank and give us a hand. The Yuletide season also means good food. The traditional dessert of the season may be Christmas pudding, but... At a Sawyer's incredible U log may start a new trend. This is what Etta means by thick. Watch, when I lift up the beater with the yolk on it, see it falls and leaves a little ribbon behind. That's thick egg yolk. And this is how you tell if the egg white is thick enough. It should make a beautiful peaks. Good. Nice stop. And cut, 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 and up and over. Don't forget to save enough batter for two cupcakes. They make the knots on your Yule log. So this goes in the oven 400 degrees for, for about 20 minutes, but keep an eye on it. Great. Terrific. Dini Petty graduates in mushroom caps. And then we cover this as well with the tines of a fork. You just go along like that. And a Van Gogh bark. Beautiful. We stick them hither and yon, and some we just allow to stand. And last night it snowed, so we are just going just the barest little bit of snow. If you drop in the city and pick up the recipes we have for you, you'll find the U-log there, and it's absolutely delicious. Now to the world of entertainment, we start with some sad news. That's right, unfortunate news out of Los Angeles. Tonight, actor Peter Lawford has lapsed into a coma. 61-year-old Lawford is suffering from kidney and liver problems, and hospital officials say his chances for survival remain uncertain. The British-born actor was once married to the sister of the late President John F. Kennedy, Patricia. Lawford has four children from that marriage. He's currently married to another lady named Patricia. She's 26 years old. Earlier this year, Lawford was treated for drug and alcohol problems problems at the Betty Ford Center. There's some great family entertainment going on at the Bayview Playhouse. It's a show called Every Kid's a Star, and it features one of my favorite children's entertainers, Bob Schneider. The Juno Award-winning performer is originally from New York, and he used to perform for grown-ups, till he realized kids were much more fun. The endearing thing about Bob Schneider is that he never condescends to kids. As a matter of fact, he claims his best material comes out of his collaborations with them. Do you think a 
certain amount of humility is required from a performer when they work with kids? I mean, a lot of adults, you know, what do you mean kids? I'm yeah. going to come up with something creative working with a kid? I have to say that I am the greatest thing in the world. Other than that, I'm very <laughs> humble. I mean, humble. <laughs> it's a hard humility. Yes. No, I, it's You're a hard, humiliated. It's a, hard, <laughs> it's a hard question to answer. I, I, do, I honestly could say this. Mm -hmm. I, I have never over the years, it's only since I've been interviewed a lot, and seriously, and um, been forced to try to understand what I do, because the, the work I've done with kids has been very instinctive. And I, I honestly feel in one with the kids. I don't feel any more or less than the kids. It's very much together thing. And all the work I've ever done, and when I do shows with kids, I, I, I look at the kids as being totally my equals in it. You know, in that respect, whether that's humility or, or whatever, or, or uh, whatever you want to call it. Immaturity. Or, or <laughs> ignorance. I don't know. But um, I honestly feel there's a certain energy. And... Um, it's just the expert. It's just treating them like like people and, and expecting kids can do anything. I have told them when people say the kids get nervous, they think that I have no doubt the kids will always come through. I am a computer man. Oh yeah, I can do anything you can. Oh yeah, I am a computer man. Ooh, I can do anything you can. You can see Bob Schneider and every kid's a star at the Bayview Playhouse through till January 6th. The rush, the partying, the weather, the shopping, the schlepping. Christmas is a crazy time of year, and to celebrate all that craziness, John Burgess checks out a new show on at the Adelaide Court Theatre. It's an original show called Mistletoe Madness, presented by the Tapestry Singers. Twelve days to Christmas, twelve days to Christmas, look at the way they do their Christmas shopping. They can go shopping and still remain calm and sedate. These are the people we envy and the people that we hate. Mistletoe Madness is a, an original musical review written by Andrew McBean for the Tapestry Singers, and it essentially investigates this kind of six-week conundrum we all find ourselves in just leading up to December the 25th. There are a lot of uh, sort of sitcom um, situations we put people in, and the, and the music provides both the link and the explanation in many cases of, of how we get to be in these positions. How did the Tapestry Singers come together? Well, this is our seventh season. Um, we've been gradually evolving from a straight singing group into a music theater. And uh, in fact, we're just about to change the name. It's going to become Tapestry Music Theater. And if it's a heavy Christmas season, you might find a little musical respite with Mistletoe Madness at the Adelaide Court Theater. Performances run nightly through this Sunday at 8 with a Sunday matinee at 2 p.m. Yoko Ono is so afraid of getting assassinated that she's actually cultivating her image as a dragon lady. The widow of John Lennon says she wants people to think of her as being negative and harsh. She feels being known as a dragon lady offers her some measure of protection. Does that explain why you're such a dragon lady? No, you're not. Oh! I'm not and I have in my oh, hand oh, oh, a oh. Christmas present for you. Oh. Oh, so we'll just put it back, it back no, in the it back. back. Oh, what is it? So then I was schlepping around <laughs> the Eaton Center today. I bought you something, that, a brick from St. Michael's oh, Hospital. Oh, teeny. Isn't the that The girl nice? who has everything. It's a great paperweight. It weighs one pound, and it's made from, um, what is it? Uh, what do you ski that they make the pottery? The mountain? Uh, Blue, oh, mountain, Blue mountain, mountain, mountain. Oh, oh, oh. Second syllable. Second. So there you go. That's your little oh, Christmas well, present. Thank you. So say you're sorry about the dragon lady I'm part. I'm sorry about the dragon Boy. lady. You're a very <laughs> nice, nice lady. lady. Thank you. What a beautiful gesture. I'll sleep with it under my pillow. Oh. Oh. How well, so, <laughs> kinky. We're standing by for Debbie Van Kinkabel and Gordon Martin. Up next with City Paul Sports. Under your pillow? Imprint it yourself. Take that such. Press forward. Stare it. So it's now punchy and all information required. Another record for Wayne Gretzky. On top of another record. Yeah. Well, the great one is even greater today. Wayne Gretzky, at the ripe old age of 23, became the youngest player in NHL history to record 1,000 points last night when the Oilers played host 
to the Kings. In his first shift, just 141 into the first period, Gretzky on a breakaway. He goes in, takes the shot, but it hits the post. Mike Krzyzelniski banged in the rebound, giving Gretzky the assist and the record. Gretzky scored his 1,000 points in 424 games compared with his closest rival, Guy Lafleur, who did in 720 games. So in just over five years in the NHL, Gretzky has 388 assists and 611 assists. That's goals and assists. And they said he lacked consistency. Last night also proved to be a record-setting evening for Scotty Bowman, who finally recorded his 691st victory when the Sabres beat the Blackhawks 6-3. Bowman is now the winningest coach in the NHL. Well, the Brother Arthur Memorial Hockey Tournament gets underway tomorrow at De La Salle Arena. Jim McKinney thought he'd check out the home team, Oakland's. At the start of the season, we heard an awful lot of good things about these Cardinal Newman Redmen. They got nipped 6-1 by Michael Power yesterday, so we decided to uh, give them another shot today. Here's a three-on-one for Newman. Number 18, Tim Green, decides to shoot himself. Vince Marinelli, great save for De La Salle. That must have pumped up the Oaklands. Here's John Mazzoli all alone, and it's 1-0. A couple of minutes later, Ralph Torrey on the backhand. Two-zip for the Oaklands. Here's Dave Callan on a break. Marinelli with the split save this time. Now the Oaklands were hitting everything in sight this afternoon. Joe Filippelli didn't care what color they were wearing. Didn't bother the Redmond though. Ev Black one out to Tim Greeny one times at home. That cut the lead to two to one. And they're gentlemen too. Mazzoli has something caught in his mask. Nick LaMacha tries to tap it out. Jeez, must have really been jammed in there, wasn't it? Early in the third. Christmas comes early for James Morano. He buries it as the De La Salle Oaklands go on to win it 5-2. And two days ago, we reported that Alex Bauman had been named Canada's Male Athlete of the Year by the Canadian Broadcasters and Sports Writers Association. Well, apparently, the French language media did not get a chance to vote, so now Canadian Press is holding a runoff vote between Bauman and Gaetan Boucher. We'll keep you posted. Now, skiing has always been one of my favorite sports, but I know from experience that without the proper equipment, it can be a nightmare. Well, the old fire hall ski shop in Unionville has taken the guesswork out of choosing the right equipment by using a computer to do the work. The computer puts 176 boots on your foot and tells you which one's best through an analysis of the foot. Okay, Debbie, what we start with is... The first thing Steve does is collect all personal data, such as height, weight, skiing ability, etc. Then he takes an imprint of the foot. And you thought your feet were ugly. Whoa. And then he diagnoses the foot's mobility. Next is the actual measuring device with the braddock. Like this, it should be done while seated. You should not stand up on this. Now with all the information collected, we feed it into the computer and wait for the printout. <laughs> And now the computer, there you are. That gives you an idea of what you should put on. This is great. It welcomes me to CompuFit. It says, hello, Debbie Van Keek, about the world's most advanced ski boot selection. The only thing I don't really like, though, is that they say my width is off by one letter, and it's outside the norm. I don't think I'm abnormal. Do you? Well, Answer that, and well, you're dead. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Okay, Debbie, now this is what the computer selected for you. It's a Solomon SX80 boot. Just slip it on, do you up. Now you're all set. You can stand up and flex it. You look like a real skier. Let's go, let's go. These are great. They feel fabulous. Super. Say one word about my feet, Martin Owen. <laughs> You do have hideous looking feet. If but, your feet have you been through what my feet that. have been through. I, I was just going to say, the reason why they are that way is because of the tremendous athletics you were involved in when you were younger. Absolutely. Much and younger. this type of thing is excellent for everybody who wants yep. to get the proper fit because if you don't have the right boots, you're going to be miserable oh, on the skiing. ski slopes. Yeah. So it really is a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Deb. Street Beat Report next when we come back.
City Pulse News test answer, the new Bank of Canada rate is 10.16%. Tonight's winner received six suntan sessions at Sunbank Island Tanning. Now here's Glenn Cole to give us the latest word from the streets of Toronto. Glenn? Thanks very much, Dini. An accident at Dundas and River has jammed up streetcar traffic and has blocked that roadway. So if you're heading out, keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that the spot checks are heading out about five minutes from now. Make sure that you're buckled up and driving safely. Have a good evening. That is Street Beat for tonight. Gordon. Thank you, Glenn. Entertainment next, Jeannie. One of Toronto's cabaret masters, David Warwick, stars in Two in Tune, which takes place at Garbo's. That's two in tune on stage at Garbo's Dinner Theatre. Gord. Thank you, Jeannie. A preview now of what to watch for on City Pulse tonight at 10 as we go live to Ann Roskowski. Gord, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler is coming in from Montreal tonight to turn himself into police. Lauren Honickman will be live at the airport with the latest on tonight's developments. Now, a late look at weather and David Onley. Thank you, Ann. There looks like there's going to be showers tomorrow by lunchtime and hopefully a white Christmas. Back inside to you, Debbie. Well, I'm going to go hit the slopes, do a few turns, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. But Jim McKinney will be here to bring you all the NHL highlights and all the scores, Dean. <laughs> Tomorrow on City Life, we are joined by Rafi, the popular children's performer. And children, Santa himself will drop by, and you can phone him from your home if you'd like. And while we're on the subject of City Life, you'll be doing a story soon, according to one of your producers, on a woman named Sandra Strong. She lives in Oshawa. She has what is known as the 20th century syndrome, I believe that's what it's called. She's allergic to almost everything. They're holding a benefit situation for her tonight at the Balmy Arms in the beaches. Even if you buy coffee, orange juice, or any alcoholic beverage, a certain portion of that price will go to the benefit fund. That's the Balmy Arms in the beaches. Goes on all night tonight. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Dragon lady. Oh, oh she I'll said it. that brick at you. you better oh. be there goes your Christmas present. Oh. That's City Pals for tonight. I'll have the next along with Ann Roskowski. Tonight at 10. Until then, thanks for tuning in. Good night. The new Toronto sweatshirts, tees, and parachute pants, available in all the hottest colors at Stitches. Everybody.